What's up guys, welcome back to the channel and to another weekly 3D model. This week, we're going to be making an orc watchtower. I came across this image a while back and it always reminded me of World of Warcraft. I used to really enjoy that game growing up and I always thought it would be a lot of fun to recreate. So once again, we're going to change things up this week and we're going to recreate this orc watchtower. So let's get started. Alright, so to start this thing off, we're going to select a cylinder and we can start blocking out one of those wood spikes. Now I thought it'd be a good idea to start with one of those barriers on the side, and then we can duplicate it to create the other four or three that are on the other corners of this tower. And then afterwards we can take this one wood spike and start duplicating it to create all the other wood pieces that are on our tower itself. Now there are a lot of different ways you can go about creating this model. For example, you could create a really low poly mesh and then put a lot of those details directly into the textures, just like they do in World of Warcraft for example. However, I thought it would be more fun to recreate those details directly into the geometry. Now I will show you later on in the video what I would have done differently if I were to create this for a video game like World of Warcraft. But in this case, we're going to create a higher poly model, possibly something that I could 3D print as a little miniature or something like that. But for now, we just have to continue blocking everything out. So what I did here was just move those vertices around and this is going to be the spiky end of my spike. So later on when I go to the UVs I can do a cut directly along this line and it'll be easier to assign different materials to the end of the spike and then to the bark main part of my log. I also don't want it to be too perfect so I'm going to go ahead and start moving some of these vertices very slightly. I can flatten out some of these edges and I can make this log look a little bit more log like. I just don't want it to be too round like a pencil. And I think the little imperfections are actually going to make the model look better. Alright, so now that we have our one piece of wood spike done, I'm just going to go ahead and UV it. So really quickly I'm going to delete history, freeze transformations, and center pivot, and then I can go ahead and open my UV editor. Then under the UV tab I can go do a camera based projection to remove all of the cuts on my model. Then at that point all I have to do is go in with the 3D cut and sew UV tool, and I can start creating cuts wherever I want them. So earlier when I moved all of those vertices to create that sharpened end on my spike, that's exactly where I'm going to do a cut, so later on in Substance Painter it's going to be really easy to apply materials to those two pieces. I'm also going to do a cut at the very bottom and at the very tip, that way they can unfold properly. Once those cuts are created, I can go ahead and do Ctrl U to unfold and then Ctrl L to lay them out. And if I quickly turn on my checkerboard, you'll see I'm getting no weird stretches and everything's looking pretty good, so this should be fine for my UVs. Alright, so really quickly, I'm just going to duplicate this over a few more times so I can start visualizing how it's going to look. And then if I modify this one spike, I can always remove the other ones and then reduplicate it a few more times again. Sometimes I just like to duplicate things over just so I can start visualizing things and it helps me piece everything together. Alright, and then I'm just going to take one more wood spike and I'm just going to rotate that horizontally so these other ones have something to lean on. Alright, so next is just creating a short little stump that can help hold this piece of wood up. So we're just going to create another small cylinder and I can scale that into place. I'm also going to add a few edge loops to this stump as well as bevel out those top edges. That way I can start modifying the shape a little bit so it doesn't look too perfect and round. Now I'm going to reuse the same corner piece for the other ones on this tower, but all I'm going to do is just rotate these stumps and pieces of wood so they all look different from one another, when in reality I'm just reusing the same piece of wood over and over again.
Alright, so all of our main objects are now blocked out on our little defensive structure. So now I just need to change a few things so each pole looks different from one another. So you can go in and just modify some vertices or you can rotate some of the objects. That way when I apply all of those textures and materials later on in Substance Painter, you're not going to have a repeating pattern throughout all of these objects. Alright, so our little defensive structure is now complete. So next up is just doing all of that rope. So if you look at that reference photo I posted at the beginning of the video, you'll see that there's rope all over these pieces of wood, basically just tying them together. Now there are a lot of different ways you can go about this. So if I were to make this for a video game, I would probably create a lot of that rope right into the material. That way I'm not adding unnecessary amounts of geometry to the scene. Now you can also create small image planes and put rope on that and that way you're really not using that many polys. However in this case, I personally think it's a lot more fun to create that rope with geometry. So we're going to go ahead and use an EP curve tool and that way I can draw out all of my rope and then I can eventually turn that into a sweet mesh. So all I did here was just using the add point tool under the curve tab at the very top. I just kept adding a point to my scene and I slowly wrapped it around my object. Now I left the polys up in the top left corner just so I can show the amount of polys that I'm adding into the scene once I eventually turn it into a sweet mesh. It's quite a lot, and in a lot of situations it's probably unnecessary. Now keep in mind I didn't try in any way to actually lower the amount of polys on this rope. I just wanted to show you that there's different ways you can approach these models depending on how you're going to use them. Now I'm not going to lie, I definitely go a little bit crazy here. So I'm not going to show you the full process of me adding all these points and wrapping this curve all around these logs. So I will fast forward it just a little bit so you don't have to watch the same thing over and over again. Alright, so like I said, I didn't make you watch the full process since I just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So here I am fast forward a bit once I was done all those curves and wrapping it around all my objects. And I have one large curve that I can turn into a sweet mesh. And that's exactly what I did. I turned this into a sweet mesh, increased those divisions depending on how many polys you want to add, and then I can just slightly start modifying this curve just so it doesn't look like that rope is overlapping with itself. So I'm just going to make sure it's not going through any of the geometry. Alright, so now that we have our defensive structure complete, we can go ahead and take one of those wood spikes we created earlier. I'm just going to duplicate that over so I can start blocking out my main tower object. So all I do here is just chop off the top of my log, the sharp end, and then I can start duplicating this log piece all around my tower. Now I didn't know exactly how many I needed, so I'm just going to experiment a little bit and play around with these shapes.
All right, so from this point on, it's pretty straightforward. I just start duplicating more logs and start reusing some of the ones I already created. So there are some more pointy or sharp logs that run horizontally on my tower walls, so I just reuse the ones I already created earlier on that defensive structure. There are also those wood panel pieces that are in the middle of my tower, and I just create a cube and then scale that down to create some small rectangles. So let's just start duplicating some more logs and wood pieces and we can finish blocking out this tower.
All right, and just like that, our main wood tower structure is all blocked out. So next up is creating that small flag that's sitting right on the front of that tower. And that's pretty straightforward as well. All I did was create a plane and I dragged down those subdivisions down to two. And then I just started moving some of those vertices to create that flag shape. And I just decided to keep this flag one-sided. So there was really no point adding some thickness to this flag object. But to be honest, I'll probably have to come back and add some thickness to it if I actually want to turn this into a 3D print. All right, so next up was creating my floor and my ladder. Once again, this is pretty straightforward. I'm just gonna reuse some of the objects I already have in my scene. So for my ladder, I'm just gonna duplicate some of those cylinders over and scale those nice and small and very tall and skinny. And then for my floor, I'm just gonna reuse those rectangle pieces I use for my wall and I can rotate those for my floor panels. And I'm also gonna make sure I create a small little opening on this floor piece for my ladder to come through. Now we're going to come back to this ladder shape later, I just want to fill in this area so I can start visualizing how everything is coming together. So really quickly, I'm just going to jump back to my tower object, and I'm just going to modify some of these shapes and move some of these objects around so they fit a little bit better together. I always like to quickly block things out and then I can come back and refine them later on. Alright, so everything is slowly coming together, now I'm just going to really quickly jump back to that defensive structure. So I just want to finalize this shape and I want to make sure that I'm happy with the rope's position. So I'm just going to go in and edit this curve once again, just really quickly make sure none of that geometry is overlapping. And once I'm happy with the shape, I can delete the history and then I can duplicate it three more times for the other three corners of the tower. Alright, so things are slowly coming together, now it's time to add a few more objects to my scene. 
So if you look at that reference photo, you'll see that there's some sort of animal skin, I think it is, that's tied on the side of my tower into those defensive barriers. So we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're just gonna duplicate that same flag object I created earlier, and we can start blocking out that shape. All right, so that shape looks good for now. We're gonna come back to it later when I start adding all my little pieces of rope, but for now, we're gonna jump back to the front of my tower. So if you look at the reference photo, there's a little piece of fabric that's tied around those logs right above my flag. So to create that, we're gonna create another small plane and I can start blocking out that shape. I'm just gonna wrap it around roughly and then once I'm happy with the first one, I can go ahead and duplicate it to create the other few that are below it. Alright, so things are coming together, now it's time to move on to all of those pieces of rope. So there are a few ways I actually went about this. I created a torus for most of my pieces of rope, but I also created some just with a sweet mesh and a line tool. So for this first piece of rope that's tied at the very front of my tower, I'm going to create an EP curve tool and draw that roughly in the points of a circle, and then I can turn that into a small sweet mesh, and I can just place that right where those two objects interact with each other. I want it to act as if it's helping tie those two logs together and helping holding it onto the tower. It's also going to help cover up that area where those two objects interact with each other, so it just looks a little bit more clean and realistic. Now don't get me wrong, a torus would have worked perfectly, for some reason I just decided to create a sweet mesh.
All right, so next was adding some more rope to the top of my tower. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna do this with a torus. I'm just gonna go in with my soft select brush and I can drag that torus and stretch it without deforming the shape too much. And then I can place that around all of those log pieces. Now the best part about this is I can actually overlap all of those UVs and it's gonna make applying a texture later on to all of these rope pieces in Substance Painter very easy. Now once again, this is not something that I would do over the whole object if I was gonna use this in a video game. It's okay to use a few toruses and reduce the polys on them to act as some sort of rope that's wrapped around, but you don't wanna to go too, too crazy because you can really quickly add a lot of polys to your scene. And to be honest, you can get away with a lot of this directly on the texture if you're not looking for a very high poly mesh. However, in this case, it's definitely gonna look better if you can add that rope as geometry. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're just gonna keep creating different toruses and stretch them to wrap around all these pieces of wood and hopefully it's gonna make it look a little bit more realistic and it's gonna look as if it's helping hold the structure together. So let's just continue on and start wrapping some rope around these objects. Alright, so like I mentioned earlier, the best part about using all of these toruses is that I can actually stack all of those UV shells. And that's going to make applying textures much easier later on in Substance Painter. So if I open up the UV editor and I turn on the checkered board, you'll see if I select all of these torus objects and then I select all of their UV shells, I can scale those nice and thin and skinny. That way when I look at my checkered board pattern, as long as those squares are looking nice and square-like, not rectangular, I'm not going to have any weird stretches. Now obviously because I went in with my soft select brush, some of these objects are going to be stretched more than others, but because that stretch is not too drastic or anything, you're actually not even going to notice in the materials. So at this point, I'm just going to keep duplicating the same torus objects that I already created, that way I know those UV shells are going to be properly stacked on top of one another.
So duplicating all of these torus objects over and over again was definitely time consuming. And I'm not going to make you sit here and watch the same thing over and over again, so I'm just going to fast forward a little bit to once I was done duplicating all of those rope objects. So here's the tower once I was done duplicating all of those rope pieces, and I mostly focused on the front and on this right side, because I'm just going to duplicate all of these right side objects over to the left. So let's just show you exactly how I do that. So I'm just going to select these, for example, this middle section, and I'm just going to group these into one group. So I'm going to go ahead and UV these objects, that way I can duplicate it to the other side and they can share the same UV space. So if I open up my UV editor, I can go delete history, freeze transformation center pivot, and then do a camera base projection to remove all of the cuts on the object. Just like we did before, I'm going to go in with that 3D cut and sew UV tool and start creating those cuts. So I'm going to make sure I do cuts right along each corner as well as these back faces. I basically want to end up with two UV shells, one on the back and one on the front. Now, if I was going to use this in a video game, I would just go ahead and delete all of those back faces since they're not in view, and it's a really good habit to get into is saving on all of those polys wherever you can. However, I'm planning to actually 3D print this, so I need that geometry there. But one thing I am going to do is take advantage of my UV space. So if I unfold these shells, you'll see I have one for the inside and one for the outside faces. So once I go ahead and finish up all these other cuts, I can actually gather up all of those inside faces and I can make them very small on my UV map since that texture quality is not important since you're not going to see it. And that's also a really good habit to get into when you do your UVs. You should definitely give priority to the outside objects since those inside faces aren't even going to be in view, so there's no point in them taking a lot of my UV space. So now that all of those panels are done, I can go ahead and select them all and control U to unfold and control L to lay them out. Now I'm just going to rotate them so they're relatively straight on and there's none running horizontally. And then I can group up all of those dark colored panels and I can shrink them on my UV map so those pink ones are much larger. And then I'm going to do the exact same process, doing a camera based projection and going into my 3D cut and sew UV tool. And I'm also going to do cuts on these pieces of log and then I can unfold those shells in my UV editor. Alright, so now that all of those are finished, I can go ahead and give this folder a name, and I can start positioning all of these shells together on my UV map. And once again, I am going to give priority to those outside UV shells, since they are the ones that are in view. And normally I would delete those back faces, but I'm going to keep them in since I may actually print this object. But I am going to make sure to shrink down those inside UV shells since they're not in view. And to be honest, I probably could have made them even smaller. All right, and once that group's all finished, I can go up to edit and go duplicate special along that Z axis, and I can flip it over for the other wall on the other side. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and repeat this exact same process for all of those objects on my right side of my tower. That way I can duplicate them over to the left side and we'll be sharing that exact same UV space. Alright, so just like I said, I went ahead and duplicated a bunch of those objects over to the left side of my tower, and now it's time to work on that ladder. So all I'm going to do here is just work on one of these ladder handle pieces, and then once it's UV'd and all of those rope pieces are complete, I can go ahead and duplicate it down the rest of my ladder. Once again, this is just going to save me space in my UV map, and it's really not important since you can barely even see my ladder in my scene. So all I'm going to do for the rope pieces is very similar to the tower rope pieces. I'm just going to create a small little torus and I can position those right where those two objects on my ladder intersect. Alright, so now that the handle and all those rope pieces are UV'd and it's looking good in my UV map, we can go ahead and duplicate it to create all the other handles on my ladder.
All right, so just like that, our ladder is finished. Now we can move on to create some little pieces of string that are dangling from my tower. So just to add a little bit more detail, I thought some hanging rope would be cool. So we're going to go in with a sweet mesh, once again, using an EP curve tool to draw out those points in roughly the shape I was looking for. And once I position those points on my tower, I can turn that line into a sweet mesh. And I'm just going to keep doing this a few more times. So I'm just going to delete the history on my rope once I'm happy with it. And I can keep reusing that same curve to create a few other pieces of rope all around my tower. All right, so really quickly before we wrap up this object, I thought we'd add one more small detail. So in the reference photo, there's some tiny little objects dangling from the very top, some sort of like little artifacts or art things. I'm not sure what they are, but they look pretty cool. So I thought I would add something similar. Now I'm not gonna spend too much time on these since they're very, very small in my scene. So I'm just gonna create a couple of cylinders and roughly block out some weird sort of shape and I can pretend it's hanging from the very top of my tower. And then I'm also going to do one on the very side, hanging off one of those wood spikes on the back of my tower as well. And if you had more time, you could keep going. I was really tempted on adding a couple of spears or weapons on the inside on that top floor of my tower. But to be honest, I already spent more time than I planned. So we're just going to wrap it up here.
All right, so that is a wrap on the modeling. Now I'll really quickly go over exactly how I did all of the UVs. All right, so here's a model in its finished form. Now this was right after I was done those UVs and I did end up adding a few tiny objects to the scene. I do never know when to quit, but I will go over those really quickly right now. So firstly, I added these tiny little metal bolts onto these wood planks. And I also duplicated this metal or wood piece right to the back to create these other two. I also went ahead and created this tiny little shield. So if you notice in the reference photo, there's a small little object that's tied up in the bottom corner here. I think it's a shield, I'm pretty sure it is. I thought it would just be a tiny little piece to add to the scene that would hopefully make it a little bit more interesting to look at. And I went ahead and also added these tiny little fabric pieces. They're the exact same ones we created up here. I just duplicated them down here as well. And hopefully that's gonna add a tiny bit more color to the scene. And then if you haven't noticed, I also added these tiny little cutouts into this flag. I thought it just looked too perfect being straight. We are gonna add a wave pattern into it in Substance Painter, but I thought it would just be cool and very orc-like to add some little cutouts like they always do in World of Warcraft. Other than that, everything else is basically the same. And I'll show you how I did those UVs. So what I decided to do was break this thing up into three different groups for the three different textures applied. Now you can definitely go about these textures however you like. For example, if it's for a video game, this whole tower should probably just be one texture map. However, this is just gonna be for some fun little renders for my channel. So I decided to break this thing up into three. So firstly, I have all of the main wood pieces on one map. Now what I made sure to do was try to keep all of these relatively the same direction. That way when I start adding that wood grain texture, it's not going to make it too challenging if they're all different angles and I can hopefully have those little line details going the exact same way. And I also added all of those little tiny rope pieces. And once again, they're all overlapping. I did add a few extra later on, but majority of them are taking up the same space. So hopefully it's gonna be really easy to apply materials later on in Substance Painter. Now my second group is all of my other wood pieces. So I have all of those wood barriers on the bottom, as well as all these middle panels and all the other little wood pieces that I forgot to add on my first map. And the only reason why I broke this thing up into two for the wood, I just thought I could have a little bit better resolution in my textures if I just made them a little bit larger, if they were very, very small, the detail obviously wouldn't be as good as if they were taking up more space. So that's really the only reason, but I really could have combined both of these into their own map. And then finally, the last group is all of the items in the scene. So my ladder, this little animal skin on the side, the flag, the shield, as well as those little objects. And I also decided to add the floor and the roof just because I had so much extra space in my UV map. I thought, why not just drag these out just so I could once again have a little bit better detail. Now how you go about doing your UVs is really dependent on how your model is going to be used. So for this, once again, my intentions were just to create a fun little fan art for World of Warcraft, as well as possibly turning this into a miniature that I can 3D print. So I'm not really sure in that case, I will have to come back and make some changes to these one-sided faces as well as some of this geometry. I just wanna make sure it's not gonna be too difficult to print with. However, I'm not preparing this for print or anything like that. We're just preparing it for Substance Painter so we can add some cool textures and do a couple of renders. All right, so really quickly before we export this and go into Substance Painter, I'm just gonna go over a few of the small things I would do differently if I were to create this for a video game. I know a few of you are gonna ask me, so I thought it'd just be helpful to go over that really quickly. So firstly, I would just deal with this rope. Now there's a ton of rope in this model, especially the ones that are just over here that aren't looping down. You can just get away with this in your texture. So in Substance Painter, I would just draw this rope with a bump effect directly into the material, and that way you can save a ton on all of these polys. Now, if you did want to have some drooping rope or you wanted just to have some extra geometry in your scene, when I start off with a torus, I just wouldn't use the one that Maya just starts off with. What I would do is a drag down some of these subdivision levels, that way you just don't have so many polys to deal with. And then once you smooth out those edges, it'll still look nice and round. Now another thing that I would do differently is probably how I did these walls. So for example, if you look at all of these wood planks, 
they're just all separate objects. And once you add so many to your scene, you start adding a lot of polys. Now what you could do is just create a simple plane and add that material and add that wood of paneling effect directly into the texture. So for example, you could just create a simple plane like this, which is using barely any polys, and you can actually have a paneling texture applied to that with a cool bump effect and it'll look like it's a panel effect. If you're not very, very up close to it or depending on the art style, it would actually be more fitting probably in World of Warcraft to do something like that. You could just get away with a lot. You'd be surprised. So that's definitely a big thing that I would do with this model. And a few other things, when I created these wood spikes right off the start, when I created my cylinder, I wouldn't just leave it at 20 or 20 edges. And I would definitely bring that way down to something as small as eight. You'd be surprised when you smooth those edges, how smooth the object actually looks. And you would save a ton just because there's so many cylinders creating all of these walls, you could definitely get away with reducing a ton of those polys right off the bat. And finally, if you wanted to add some cool rope effect, you actually don't need to do that with a torus or a cylinder or even a sweet mesh. You could actually simply use a plane. So this is done a lot in video games to save on especially background meshes. You can just basically put an image of something on it and it would look like something's there. So for example, I could just keep extruding one of these edges. So let's say I did something like this. Obviously this isn't that great, but just to show you an example, you could put that into this roughly the position of that rope and act as if it's sort of hanging there. And then what you could do is add a cool rope just texture directly onto this plane. So the rest of it would be transparent and all you'd see is just a rope hanging here. And you probably wouldn't even be able to know it's actually a plane unless you came really close to it or you were looking at it at some weird angle. And the whole other option would just be having a high and low poly workflow. So I could basically take all of the maps produced from this high poly mesh and I could project them onto a low poly mesh. So either creating a whole other low poly mesh or even removing some of this geometry that I don't need like all of those pieces of rope. And I could still have all of that height and bump information and I can translate that over to my low poly mesh. And I will do that in a future video. Now when it came to this model, I was more or less just creating fan art off of World of Warcraft. And I may actually turn this into a tiny little miniature as a 3D print, in which case I would have to come in and actually prepare this model for print. A lot of these faces are one-sided and I'm not sure if a lot of this geometry, how it's set up would print properly. However, we're not preparing this for print. We're just preparing it for Substance Painter so we can go and texture and create some really cool, fun renders. So those are just a few of the things I would do differently if I was to make this for a video game. So I would have approached this model much differently depending on how it's going to be used. And there are a lot of factors that go into that. Everything from what platform it's going on and what engine is it being used on. So is it Unreal Engine 5? Is it Unity? Is it going on a PC game where you can have millions of polys? Or is it just going on a mobile game where you're limited on your poly count? And then there's also other factors like is it a main character prop or is it just a background prop? There are a lot of things that can change how you approach your models. And you can save a lot of time on your whole 3D process by figuring out these questions early on. So hopefully that clarifies a few of the questions about game ready models and I promise I will have other game ready assets on this channel. I just personally always find it's more fun creating these higher poly assets. So that's exactly how I did all of those UVs. Now let's jump over to Substance Painter so we can start texturing. All right, so now in Substance Painter, let's go ahead and load in our FBX file from Maya. And once everything's loaded in and it looks all correct, we can go over to our texture set settings, scroll down to bake mesh maps, and we can bake out our textures. So all I do here is choose my output size, I set that to 4K, and make sure to check on that use low poly mesh as high poly mesh since we only have one mesh to worry about. Now there is a change you should do here with your AO. Now I'm gonna show you firstly what it would look like if I just bake these out as is. So let's go ahead and just bake out these textures. So as you see, it has all of these dark shadows all over the geometry. 
And that's just because I'm reusing a lot of these same objects in other places and it's taking that information from other objects that are overlapping it, like other pieces of rope, and it's creating that AO information. So a simple fix is go into your baking settings, scroll down to ambient occlusion and change self occlusion to only same mesh name. And that's just going to filter the meshes by their name to avoid matching with unwanted geometry and you're not going to have that shadow effect appear on all your other objects. So if we go ahead and just rebake these textures, you'll see that those black darkness on the geometry goes away. Now this is, has happened in previous videos and I honestly don't even bother changing it because when I go into the render you don't even see those black lines. But technically just to make the whole process of editing and applying textures easier without seeing that blackness all over the place, you should just do it this way. Alright, so the textures are baked and all of those black lines are removed and it's looking correct, so now we can start texturing. So there's two materials from the Substance Source website that I use in this project. So we're going to drag those into my project and I'm going to set them to the current session. One is a tree trunk, so it's a stylized tree trunk material that I'm going to use for the end pieces of my logs. And then another one is a stylized wood beam. Once again, drag that into my current session, and this is just going to be the outside of all my bark pieces on my wood. So we're going to start off with that stylized wood beam. I'm going to drag that over into my layers, and we're going to apply it to my log pieces. Now right off the bat, the texture is pretty large, so we're going to change the tiling so I can make it quite a bit smaller on my objects. And then I'm just going to go mess around with that color. I wasn't really sure the direction of the color I wanted, and you'll see throughout the whole texturing process, I frequently come back and change that color. I think it's important not to obsess over getting it perfect right off the start. Then you can just drag out the whole texturing process for hours or even days by just obsessing over getting everything perfect. It's just nice to fill in those empty spaces and once everything slowly comes together it's going to be more obvious how that color should be. So let's go ahead and just choose a grayish brown color for those logs. And once I'm happy with that I can set it to a black mask and go to UV chunk fill and start clicking on all of those UV chunks where that main bark material will be on my logs. Alright, so next up is working on the end pieces of these logs. So we're going to use that stylized trunk texture that we brought in at the very beginning of this project. And we're going to apply it to all of those end pieces. So all we're going to do is drag that stylized trunk onto my layers. And I can start moving those offsets so it matches up with one of those trunks. And then all I have to do is right click set it to a black mask, to a UV chunk fill, and I can apply it to that specific UV chunk. And then I can just repeat that same process over and over again to all of my other trunks. And then once I'm happy with it, I can go ahead and just adjust all of their colors so they're all accurate. Now unfortunately, on my UV map, they're not overlapping in a lot of these spaces. So I will have to reapply this material over and over again to all of them. Alright, so next is just doing all of those sharp pointy pieces on the ends of my logs. So I'm just going to go over to my smart materials, I'm going to go choose one of those wood materials and I can apply it to that end piece. Once again setting to a black mask, choosing UV chunk fill, and because we did that cut right along that edge, we can go ahead and just fill in that whole UV chunk. 
Now, as you can see, I first chose that wood chip smart material that comes with Substance Painter. Getting some weird lines in that material and just wasn't looking realistic. So I decided to switch it up soon enough to that wood beach texture. All right, so now that that is looking much better, I can go ahead and right click, set it to a black mask. And once again, using that UV chunk fill, I can ascend to all of the tips and my pointy parts of my logs. All right, so the wood's looking good for now. Next up is just the rope. So I'm gonna go over to my materials tab. I'm gonna go choose one of those rope materials and I'm gonna apply it to those meshes. And once again, because a lot of those UVs are overlapping, it makes applying these materials really easy. All I have to do is just assign it to one and all of my rope pieces are basically all textured. And then all I'm gonna do is just drag down that tiling so I can make that rope texture a little bit smaller on those objects so it looks more realistic. All right, so all of those meshes have textures applied. Now, in my opinion, it's looking a little bit too clean. So I wanna add a little bit of dirt and grunge on top of these materials. So all we're gonna do is add a fill layer. I can go over to my masks tab and I can drag on whatever masking effect I would like to add so I can add a little bit of dirt and grunge. Now in my opinion, this is important to really gradually build it up and add different masking effects so it looks more realistic. Don't just go with one and make it very obvious. I always find I get better results when I make them very subtle and I gradually build them up. All right, so those materials are looking good. Now I can move on to my next texture set, which is my second wood material. So all I'm gonna do here is copy those same ones I just created on this texture set, and I'm gonna copy them over to the other one. And just like we did before, we're gonna assign it to a black mask and using the UV chunk fill, we can assign it to those specific UV chunks. Now, as you can see in this texture set, I do have some bark pieces that are actually running horizontally on my UV map. So they're actually not vertical like all the other ones. So some certain pieces of wood, those grains are gonna be off and it's gonna look incorrect. So all I'm gonna do for those is not apply this material to those specific meshes, and I can just duplicate the same material over and I can change the rotation so they're running vertically instead of horizontally, and I can reassign it to those other meshes. So just like we did on the first texture set, let's go ahead and fill in all of these empty meshes with materials.
Alright, so all of those wood materials are copied over from my first texture set to my second, and I applied them to all of those meshes. Now on this texture set, I also do have those wooden planks that I have on my tower. So for this, we're going to go back to our Smart Materials folder, and I'm going to choose a different Smart Material to add to those wood meshes. I thought it'd be interesting to add another wood material, that way it looks a little bit different and it's not all too consistent throughout all the meshes. Alright, so next up were those fabric meshes that were helping hold those logs together. So for this, I just jumped over to my materials folder and I chose a random fabric material to apply to those meshes. Now I also changed the color to more of a red. We can come back and tweak that red color once we add materials to our flag, but for now, let's just fill in these meshes. Alright, so all of these meshes now have materials applied, now it's time to add some more dirt and grunge. Specifically, those wood planks are looking way too clean, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and add a fill layer, then we can go choose some different masking effects so we can add some dirt and grunge. Alright, so things are looking much better now, now it's time to move on to our last texture set which are all of the items. So we're going to start off with the flag. So for this, I'm going to go back to my smart materials and I'm going to choose this flannel fabric material that comes with substance. Once I assign it to the flag, all I'm going to do is just remove that black striped pattern, and then I can just start tweaking some of these settings so I can make it look more like a flag material. I do however like that crease and wave pattern that comes with this material, so that's why I just decided to work with this one.
All right, so now it's time to add a logo. So when looking at this tower, I instantly got Horde vibes because it's an orc tower, so I think it makes sense. So I quickly jumped onto Google, found a Horde logo, and I brought that into Photoshop to create my own alpha. While I was in there, I also created another one for the shield. That way we can go print this Horde logo directly onto my flag and shield. And once again, we don't want it looking too clean, so we're gonna add another fill layer and then I can add some more dirt and grunge on top of it. Alright, so next up is the shield. So we're going to do the exact same process. I'm going to choose a wood material and assign it to the inside of my shield just by going to the UV chunk fill. Once again, I added a nice cut right along the edge of my shield. That way it's really easy for me to apply these materials. And then I'm also going to go to my smart materials folder and choose that iron forge material. And I'm going to assign that to the outside of my shield to all of those metal pieces. And then like I showed you earlier, I'm going to take that other Horde logo that I created in Photoshop and I'm going to print a nice Horde logo directly onto the shield. Now I'm just going to keep repeating the same process for all of the other meshes that we have remaining in our scene. So I'm going to go choose a nice leather material for that animal skin and some more wood materials for the top of my roof and my floor. So let's go ahead and wrap up these last few meshes.
Alright, so we finally have materials applied to all of our meshes in our scene, so now we can quickly jump into the renderer to see how things are looking. So all I'm going to do here is just remove that background image on my floor, so I'm going to check on clear color, and then I'm also going to raise that floor level so it matches with the bottom of my model. I'm also going to scroll down and bring up that focal length from 17 to 35. Now this is very subjective depending on how you want to view your model, I just always find changing your focal length to 35 or 50 is a little bit more realistic. Alright, so things are looking good and at this point it's just a matter of jumping back into the editor and just tweaking some of those materials and colors until I get them into more of a final state that I'm happy with. And to be honest, this is probably the most important part. These final adjustments really make a big difference with how your final model looks. So just take your time and tweak things until you're happy with your final results. Anyways, that's basically the whole texturing and modeling process that I did to create this orc watchtower. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to see more weekly 3D content. And if I do end up actually printing this model, I will definitely let you guys know and show you an update. Also, if you'd like to support the channel even further, as well as get access to additional content, check out my Patreon page which is linked in the description below. I'm also going to start uploading more models that you can access through my Patreon page, so keep an eye out for that. Anyways, thanks so much for tuning in and I'll catch you guys in the next one.